So, Film Sparks. Yes? You are a rarity fan. Well, on my list of favorite unicorns, Twilight is my most favorite. Alicorn now. Oh, right. I forgot. That's okay. So did the writers. And I love rarity. I know how Rarity feels about designs and details because I myself am a striving artist who has a passion and attention to detail. And you want to talk about Rarity Takes Manhattan? Yes, but not just because it's another Rarity episode. It's also because I really wanted to see how they portray Manhattan, being a New Yorker myself. What are your thoughts on Dave Polsky? Well, Over the Barrel was an okay episode, and I did love feeling Pinky Keen. But can he write for a character like Rarity? Interesting. Do you have $20? Um, yes. Perfect. Let's collab. Oh, Manhattan, what you do to me? Such a huge, bustling community. And there's always opportunity. Well, we finally got a Rarity episode. It's only been... Two years. What, really? Yep. The last episode to feature Rarity as the central focus was Sweet and Elite, and that aired on December 3rd, 2011. Dang. So, there's been some excitement for this episode, even before we knew the plot. After all, a lot of fans were hoping for her to get some focus in Season 3. Including me, which is funny considering that when I first watched this series, I thought I would hate Rarity. Yet with a few episodes, she quickly shot up as one of the show's most diverse characters. I actually liked Rarity from the beginning. I know that a lot of people have made her come off as snooty, but I knew she would be an interesting character. This episode is very well timed as it's a more down-to-earth tale. I enjoyed the gimmick aspects of Power Ponies and Bats, yet we needed a story that cast the characters in a more relatable light. So the big question is, can Dave Polsky pull off writing for Rarity as well as Charlotte Fullerton or Megan McCarthy? We start off with the main six getting ready to leave with Spike, once again getting the shorter end of the stick. Yeah, get used to that. We are going to see a lot of it this episode. And with one quick train ride, we find ourselves in the city of... Whoa! Manhattan, which of course has a few of our most famous buildings and landmarks being represented in the show, like the Chrysler, Madison Square Garden, the Statue of Liberty, Grand Central Station, the Plaza, not sure what that building with the pony head on top is supposed to be, and of course, we also have Pony Times Square. Woo, there's a sale on at Macy's. Whoa, 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 wait a second. I mean, this is nicely designed, but it's too nice. It should at least be much more crowded. I mean, look at Times Square. It's practically desolate. They should have at least more ponies or taxis. And the city is just too clean. It should be a little bit dirty. And there should be at least a homeless pony in the background. I loved how Manhattan was designed, but the creators could have done just a little bit more detail to the city. I can see Donald Rump. Hi, Donald. You're fired. I do not work for you, dummy. Now, I gotta bring up a continuity issue here. Why is Rarity so fixated on this contest? She's already designed wardrobes for a princess, been a main stylist for another princess, and been recognized by some influential fashion ponies. Does she really have anything to gain from visiting Manhattan for Fashion Week? Well, of course. She's a self-promoting artist, and Manhattan in the real world is considered the beaming fashion icon of the US. And Manhattan should be the same for Equestria, since Rarity strives to be the best at fashion design, meeting other top fashion designers and promoting in Manhattan could mean huge things for her. One meta joke later, we get our first Rarity song in a while. I'm on the record as saying that I don't care for defining the main six solely by their elements. Yet this episode did a great job of showing Rarity at her best and worst. It isn't just about her being generous, it's about how she reacts to situations for both good and ill. And the first issue she runs up against is that she's almost late to the fashion show gathering and has to hop a taxi. Fast. In Manhattan. I think she'd have better luck getting a fresh set of wings from Twilight and flying there. Now, I gotta ask a native New Yorker. Half the fandom is up in arms that Princess Twilight can't catch a cab. Are New Yorkers really like this? Well, that's the basic stereotype of New Yorkers in my opinion. New York is a very busy place full of people who have places to go, and driving around New York City is considered a luxury, so it's the norm to catch a cab, a bus, or a subway. I believe also that New Yorkers act really pessimistic and grumpy because they feel like they're gonna get screwed over, so they act like this to avoid being screwed over. And I wouldn't recommend giving Rarity wings. We're already dealing with one male alicorn in the background. The who's a what now? Right there! by Celestia's unmentionables. Do you realize what this means? No. I pray you never do. The floodgates have opened. Anyway. Ah!
Rarity makes it the fashion show when we are introduced to Prim Hemline, or as I like to call her, Miss Harshwinnie 2.0. Now, you littlest ones will have the chance to compete for a weighty responsibility of your very own. How is it that all your competitors are here half an hour early, and yet you arrive seconds before we begin? Professionalism, Miss Dash, I must insist. We keep to a precise schedule, so let's try to be more than a few seconds early, hmm? That is all. Dismissed. Then we are introduced to the two-faced backstabbing pony, who I think is definitely related to Diamond TR somehow, Suri Polomare. And when she was being really super friendly with Rarity, I knew she was being coming. Rarity then shows her this new special fabric that took her months to make. And Suri is more than impressed, and even has the gall to ask her for a swatch for accents. But Rarity foolishly gives her a whole damn bolt of fabric, to which Suri then makes a whole line with the fabric, making Rarity look like a copycat. <laughs> the bitch. I actually worked with someone like this. All sweet and friendly until she twists that knife in your back. Rarity takes this betrayal pretty hard. My generosity has ruined me, I tell you. Ruined! Would you like some cheese with that wine? Certainly. I'm quite proud and impressed that Rarity could recover after months and months of work being put down the toilet after that bitch stole it from her and claimed it as her own original work. Rarity demonstrates her usual creativity and quick thinking with her said hotel chic. Well done, Rarity. But all's not well amongst the main six. Suri's manipulation and the stress is getting to Rarity. Much like in Suited for Success, the situation is clouding Rarity's judgment and values. And she's taking out her feelings on the other ponies, very much the way Suri was treating her assistant, Coco Pomel. And that's why Suri is my favorite kind of antagonist. Those powerful, world-conquering villains are fun, yet the real appeal for me lies in the antagonists who serve as a dark mirror for our heroines. The thought here is that Rarity can become a lot more like Suri if she abandons her morals. It really broke my heart to see how she was treating her friends. I go out of my way to get you tickets for a show, and this is how you repay me? By abandoning me in my hour of need? I mean, look at how Rarity turns her hotel room into a sweatshop. Where's Spike? Huh? Where is Spike? He's not in any of these shots. Either he's napping in the back, or the ponies lost him in the Manhattan streets and he's wandering, cold and alone. You? are really dark. Yeah, I get like that sometimes. Rarity debuts her new fashion line, catching the eye of several returning characters. Yet when Rarity sees that her friends are missing, she realizes that going for the victory has a much greater price. And this is where the episode shines. A lesser story would have simply been about winning the competition. Here, the focus shifts to Rarity's internal conflict and her attempts to reconcile. Rarity surges the city high and low for her friends. And when she finds them back at the fashion show, Suri tricks Rarity once more by telling Rarity that Prim was really pissed that Rarity left, and as a result, she lost the contest. Yet the prospect of losing a contest doesn't bother Rarity anymore, as she's once again placing an emphasis on her friends and being generous. So she pulls a few strings against every pony, including Spike, to see a musical she's been promising. Then the assistant for Suri turns up in the theater and reveals the truth to Rarity about how she actually won. I've worked for Suri for so long, I started to believe that it really is every pony for herself in this town. Until I saw how generous you were with your friends and how generous they were with you. I think that this is a fantastic turn of events, that Rarity's generosity affects someone in such a positive and moving way. And because of Coco's courage against her bitch boss, she can move forward in the fashion industry. This turned out to be a happy ending for everyone, except thankfully, Suri. I'm gonna play devil's advocate here and list a few shortcomings. First off, did Rarity have to win a contest that no longer appealed to her? Some of the best episodes in Friendship is Magic showed the ponies losing a competition, yet coming away feeling better. Also, Rarity's generosity has had a boomerang effect, which might give kids a false idea. Being generous to others doesn't guarantee that something good will happen to you in return. In fact, you might not gain from the experience or know that you've had an impact. Yet, that doesn't mean there aren't benefits. Many individuals, like Coco Pamel, are influenced by random acts of kindness and generosity and may just pay it forward. I can appreciate that they're pitching the benefits to a younger audience, yet I think this ending might be too clean. You have a good point, but Rarity and the others went through so much already, and her friends were sad that she was going to stay in Manhattan for a while. Also, it still gave a good ending for Coco. There's also the fan desire to see Suri get her comeuppance, which is fair, yet I don't think this episode suffers from the absence. We don't need to see her suffering to know that she's lost this contest in every way. This episode was amazing. There was so much development for Rarity and the others. And we got to see more of Manhattan. And we also got a great moral. Be caring, but careful. My only real issues are that Spike is underutilized again and the ending might be a little too perfect to be believable. None of these hiccups are enough to make me see this as anything other than a strong entry for Polsky. Well, Silverquill, it's been super fun working with you and showing you around Manhattan.
what the hell? What's going on? Remember when I said that the floodgates had opened? Well, here's the result. One male alicorn in the show means that everybody wants to create their own alicorn OC. Run, Film Sparks, run! <sighs> this would be easier if you... I don't know why. My animator's too lazy for that. 